let's get started. So um, we are on episode, I believe, seven of our Hunt New Mexico 2021 um, Big Game Draw series. Um, so far in the last month or so, we've talked about how to read the draws report, um, Hunter Education, how to read the rules and information booklet. We talked a couple of weeks ago to Oren, who runs Idea Program, and last week to Travis. Um, and so this week, I'm really excited to introduce Tony, who runs all of our prong, he's our pronghorn biologist for the state. Um, and while everybody is logging in, I just want to send a couple of reminders. Um, if you are joining us here on Zoom, um, feel free to type your questions into the the chat and into the Q&A. We'll be monitoring those and answering as many questions as we can throughout the evening. And for those of you joining us on Facebook, um, please make sure and type your questions in there. It's a very short-lived window, so I'll do my best to catch all the window with all the questions as they pop up there. But um, we would love to, to have the, the questions that you guys have. We'll do our best to address those tonight. Um, so let's, let's go ahead and get started. So Tony, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, so I am originally from Minnesota, uh, way up north, and it's kind of looking like it outside now. Um, but uh, I, I grew up there and attended the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point, um, and I got my undergrad there and got a master's position working on working with pronghorn in the Texas Panhandle. And so I went down to South Texas and went to Texas A&M Kingsville and got my master's there. And then uh, in July of 2019, I got uh, applied for the position here and received it. And so now I'm happy to say I work in New Mexico and work with uh, one, of the, one of the coolest ungulates in North America. Yeah, that, that's awesome. They've always been a fascinating creature to me. And when you look at the difference between pronghorn and other species like deer and elk and just they're so different even though on the outside their body shape may look fairly similar to some of the other species mm -hmm. but their characteristics are just so different and fascinating so let, let's start with that um so do you want to tell us a little bit about pronghorn and the habitat like where you can find them um here in new mexico mm -hmm. yeah so uh pronghorn are a species that that inhabits the great plains um and and short grass prairies throughout the united states uh mainly uh west of you know oklahoma kansas kind of that that western line all the way to california um they do extend into mexico and into canada up north um and they're they're extremely versatile they they can endure, you know, negative temperatures and high winds, and they also <laughs> live in the deserts in, in, uh, in uh, like Sonora, uh, Mexico. And so they can tolerate extreme temperatures. Uh, they, they usually uh, eat a lot of forbs. I think over 80% of their diet is, is small forbs that are on the prairies. Um, and they, uh, they're, they're really neat individuals. Um, they require, you know, water and, and food like normal animals, um, but they kind of live in, in less, uh, less shrubby areas than you would find a lot of other ungulates, you know, like deer and elk with, with trees and, and mountainous terrains. Uh, pronghorn rely on their eyesight uh, for almost everything. And so they, they like large expanses of land where they can see across it and, and move across it. It's fascinating. And you and I were talking a few weeks ago, um, uh, working on a different story, and we, we talked about the history of pronghorn in New Mexico, and yeah. I found that fascinating. So I, I know we haven't delved uh, into the history of other species here in the state, or at least as far, but c can you just kind of briefly touch on, on the history and, and kind, of, kind of how antelope have, and pronghorn have made a recovery here in New Mexico? Yeah, uh, I guess it's a story that gets repeated a lot for a lot of Western Western ungulates. Um, prior to 1850 or so, uh, they weren't, they, they were expansive. Uh, they went all over the place. Their numbers uh, were were in the millions um, across, across just the Western states even. Um, and uh, once once the uh, the Homestead Act of 1862 passed and allowed a lot of people that lived on the East Coast to start moving west and claiming land, um, they they started turning to you know abundant natural resources for food, um, and the biggest one probably being uh, you know the American bison. Everyone knows the story behind that, 
Um, but once, once bison and elk were pushed off the plains um, and, and people still live there, they needed food. Um, and longhorn was, was one of the species that remained out there. And uh, it turned into a large, a large hunted animal. Um, it was sold for, you know, parts and, and hides and stuff. And then, uh, you know, with Western ex expansion, we also Im improved a lot of rangelands for grazing. Um, farmers and ranchers added in fences and put a lot of cattle on the landscape. Um, and those those three things, you know, uh, unregulated hunting and kind of unregulated grazing, um, and then putting fences pretty much everywhere to keep those cattle in, uh, led to a huge crash in populations. Um, and I mean, the towards the end of the 1800s, it was it was as low as uh, a couple, you know, maybe 10,000, 12,000 pronghorn in the Western United States total. Um, and through the efforts of a lot of legislation and a lot of hunters um, and, and fisher uh, men and women pushing to Im, Im put rules and regulations in place. Um, and then with the foundation of a lot of game warden agencies um, and, and the positions of game wardens to enforce those laws, uh, we were able to bring pronghorn back to uh, the, the numbers you see today. Um, and it was a, a big struggle from about 1900 to 1930 to recover those animals to huntable levels. Um, a lot of those seasons were closed and we were trying to recuperate them. And um, I saw one figure that uh, New Mexico has done such a good job at recovering them over the last uh, 100 years. They've actually um, sent over 30,000 pronghorn to other states and countries, uh, including, you know, Mexico. Um, to, to help bolster their their populations and recover populations there. So we've we've in, in this state in particular has done a fantastic job of of uh, recouping their their numbers and and making them so that everyone can enjoy them again. It's pretty fascinating, and I know one of the challenges with pronghorn with the fencing because they don't jump fences typically. They prefer to go under them, um, and so it's really interesting now when you when you drive around and see a lot of those those fences, the wire fences that have the bottom bottom strand raised so the pronghorn specifically can make it under there. And, uh, you know, we were talking a few weeks ago about um, how private landowners are still today really doing their best to, in many cases, doing their best to help help raise fences and help with grazing and providing water for, for pronghorn across New Mexico. And, it's a it's a great story so <laughs> yeah yeah and you know a lot of it starts with the science and, and the management decisions but once once we figure out what's good for the animals and what helps them and what they need um, a lot of the implications of those those findings actually end up going through uh, private landowners and they're the ones that implement it and help you know have these sanctuaries for for animals it's really cool it is it's really neat it's a, it's a great partnership so are there different species of pronghorn or, or, um, or are, is it just one species? Uh, there's, there's a lot of subspecies of pronghorn. Um, I don't know off the top of my head, I think it's six or seven, um, but uh, Cal, uh, there, there's a Baja one, um, the a Sonoran pronghorn uh, comes into the southern edge of Arizona. Um, then they've broken out some of the northern ones up around like Idaho and Alberta as well. Um, but they're, they're all just one, one whole species. Um, and if you look back into the, the paleological, you know, fossils and everything, uh, North America had several different actual species of pronghorn. Um, there's some that look like oryx, you know, big three foot horns over the top of their heads, uh, some with six or eight uh, prongs instead of just the one. Um, there's some really, really cool fossil records of them, but we're, uh, we're just left with the one today, so. That's, that's fascinating. I did not know mm -hmm. that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> so what are some of the other characteristics with pronghorn? Like how often do they need water? Um, where are you going to see them throughout the day and, and throughout the seasons? Where would you, where would you look for them? Yeah, uh, they, they aren't too difficult to spot most of the time. Um, they're, they're big white butts out there on the, the prairie are pretty, pretty easy to spot. Um, yeah, they stand out quite a bit. Um, 
Their, their water demands, um, they, they use water frequently if it's available uh, and they, they'll travel you know, anywhere from three to four miles to get it. But uh, for the most part, pronghorn are able to get water from the foods that they eat. And a lot of that, that metabolic water can sustain them for, uh, there, there's some records of over a week or more uh, of not needing to get water if there's, there's green enough food for them to eat. Um, a lot of hunters sit water. <laughs> I know in Wyoming that's a big deal, um, especially if it's hot and you're hunting in, in August or September and you know the bucks are, are running and running around. Um, they'll, they'll get thirsty and they will drink um, and so those aren't bad places to find them. We do see, we do see them going to those areas but they don't have to. Um, it's, it's, pronghorn are hard because their, their food is so uh, dispersed throughout most landscapes that they can they can walk around anywhere and it's hard to pinpoint them in any one place so um, a lot of times water or fence crossings are, are places that hunters will see them uh, when they're out in the field um, and then other times they're just they're walking around uh, middle of nowhere you know grassland uh, some, some of the areas in the state have a lot more shrubs and brush um, and they might go there for some shade if it's really hot days uh, you can see them, you know, in the shade of telephone poles or wind turbines even. Um, but they, uh, they go pretty much anywhere they want to, honestly. So. How far do they typically range during uh, a day or during a week? Uh, I've, seen, I've seen movements as far as 12 miles in a week or so, um, you know, from the top end to the bottom end of, of a, a range. Um, but they're, they're, they're pretty agile critters and they don't mind moving a lot. I'd say daily, they probably move at least three to six miles. Um, and then if they really need to, if they really need to boogie, they can move a lot faster and a lot further. Um, and so, yeah, if there some season, there are some seasonal movements in the state where they're going from areas that have, you know, are maybe lower and get a lot of snow and they'll move 10, 12 miles in, in a direction that's more open for them. Um, where there aren't fences or where there's water available, that kind of stuff. Um, and then we have one population in the state for sure that does migration. Uh, and I know Travis and Oren both touched on that, but uh, there's the herds up in like 52 and four. Um, and those- Cows Pueblo. Yep, yep, they're, uh, they're all the way up at 10,000 feet and they'll move all the way down to the Taos Pueblo for winter. And then they move all the way back up into the mountains for, for summer ranges and that, I think the longest I've seen is over 20 miles, close to 25 miles one way, so. And that fascinates me, because when I think of pronghorn, I think of driving along I-25 and seeing them between Santa Fe and, and Raton. So when you're telling me they're at 10,000 feet, that just doesn't, doesn't quite equate in my head. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, it's, that it's rare. <laughs> no, it's <laughs> extremely rare. Uh, and I think that's why we have callers on the pronghorn up there is because it's not something you see often. Uh, I think there's a handful of populations throughout the West, maybe three or four, that have animals over 9,000 feet. Um, and, and these ones are up over 10 at least. And uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty rare that you see that kind of movements from, from pronghorn uh, up into those higher areas. But the forage is really good. And when the snow melts, there's a lot of green up there. Um, so they, they've figured it out. And and they know to move when they need to move. I can't wait to see the results from that study because it's just it just fascinates me. I'm sure it does you as well. <laughs> oh yeah, totally. <laughs> so are pronghorn pretty consistent in, in their body shapes and sizes? I, I do they do they fluctuate a lot, and, and specifically do their ears fluctuate a lot, or does that give a, a good judge when you're field um, uh, judging using their ears to judge how big their their horns are? Yeah, uh, that's that's a pretty good way. Um, their their bodies are once once they hit adulthood um, or or into their adult size, um, which comes fairly quickly. Uh, after about a year, um, you can tell a juvenile from an adult, other than you know maybe if you've seen a lot of them, you could. But um, you know, especially bucks, but yeah, they they grow up into adults very quick, um, and so most of their their size is is fairly comparable um i know their ears measure about six inches uh or yeah about six inches long um and like the a lot of uh, another 
guide for, for judging uh, uh, the horn size. Um, a lot of people look at the eyes. Um, and so from the front of the eye to the back of the eye is about two inches. And so people use that to, to feel judge the, the width of the, the prong or of, of the, the horn. Um, and and those, are, those are pretty standard measurements on those animals. That's fascinating. And then they shed their sheaths annually, right? They don't shed the horn, but just the sheath, the black part on the outside. Do, do they change much in their, their um, horn growth after they shed those off? Um, yeah, so they, they shed them every year, uh, usually about November, November to December, somewhere in there. Uh, the, the males will drop the old ones and they drop them because the new one's actually growing up underneath it. Um, and so you'll see that, you know, a, a, an adult male sometimes will have one side missing but not the other and then they'll have this little black nub and that's the new one that's starting its growth for the next year. Um, and usually the shape doesn't change too much. You could, you could tell a male from one year to the next year, uh, even though it has a whole different set of, of horns, um, or at least the sheets. But the, uh, the, the large bone underneath will, will have some maybe different growth pores and stuff like that that will cause, um, you know, goofy looking prongs or longer prongs or, or stuff like that. And so you can tell those individuals from year to year, um, even though they've, they've shed off their sheets. That's awesome. I, I am looking for a picture. Someday I will get a picture of a, um, a pronghorn who has shed off one of the sheets. And <laughs> so when yeah, you it's pretty it, rare. send it to me. <laughs> and, and, you know, ranchers, I, I see some people who are really good about finding them. You can find sheets once they're shed. And I, I know a lot of ranchers that do, but they get, uh, they get eaten up by rodents pretty quickly out there. Um, they're a good source of, of nutrients for those, those animals. So usually they don't last through the winter. Yes. I, I have two sheaths. Um, I didn't find either one of them, but, but people that I was out hunting with found them and gave mm -hmm. them to me. And they're sitting on my desk in Santa Fe and I, I'm, I'm missing them because it's really a, a cool, <laughs> a cool thing. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So we talked a little bit about the pronghorn um, in, in their great eyesight. Um, so do they have other really good senses? Are there, is their smell really good? Are they good hearing? And then my other question with that is on their eyesight, is there a magnification? Like you could turn up your, your scope or your binoculars to a higher magnification. Do, do they have something like that or what makes their eyesight so good? Yeah. Uh, so uh, they, their senses are incredible. <laughs> um, I, it, if pronghorn weren't curious, uh, I don't think we'd ever shoot one. Um, they, uh, they, they make mistakes just because they're, they're curious about, you know, what that thing is over there that they saw. Um, if you've seen a pronghorn, it's seen you already. Uh, I think their eyesight is, is well over close to two miles, I want to say. Is there somewhere between a mile and two miles for their, uh, their visibility? Um, and their hearing is, is fantastic. Uh, it's not as good. It, it, it doesn't need to be too good for what they what they do. Usually, they're pretty close to their uh, their fellow pronghorn, um, and so they don't need to hear a whole lot. And if an animal's sneaking across the prairie, it doesn't make too much sound, uh, like if it's going through the woods. Um, so their their hearing is good, uh, but it's not. I wouldn't equate it to like a mule deer or or something like that. Um, and then their their sense of smell is also also really good. Uh, they release a lot of um, scents when they're mating and rutting um, and bucks will scent mark yucca. You know, you'll see them rubbing their cheek patches along it and stuff like that. And other bucks can pick that up from several miles away as well on the, on the wind. Um, they have really, really good uh, noses. Uh, even, even the size of their nose is comparable. Uh, it, it's comparable to that of a, of a mule deer, even though they're a third of the size. And so um, they have very large noses for their, for their size. A lot of that's to help breathing while they're running, but um, some of it also helps with, with scent. So those are really good ones. And then um, I don't know the exact magnification. I was going to look that up. Uh, but the, the reason they can see so well, if you've ever cut into a pronghorn eye, um, they have a lot of layers of, of tissue there and all of its magnification. Um, there's got to be at least four or five layers of, of eye tissue, of, of lens um, that help them to see that far. 
Okay, I have a new bucket list item to cut into a pronghorn's eye. That sounds really <laughs> twisted, but I am, yeah. I am fascinated. I was on a hunt, a, a little story, sorry. Um, I was on a hunt a few years ago and I was hunting with a nurse and we ended up having a full anatomy lesson and cutting open kidneys and livers. And mm -hmm. it was absolutely fascinating to see how everything is put together. So yep. um, somebody on Facebook says that Albertsons has them, which scares me just a little, but I'm going to have to look. <laughs> yeah, do it. <laughs> yes. So what, what are the biggest predators for, for pronghorn? Uh, for pronghorn, um, there, there, there's a range of them. Usually uh, the largest predator of pronghorn is, is coyotes. Um, they, they really do a number on them when they're fawns and they're younger. Um, it's one of the, one of the few ungulate species where intense, intense harvesting of coyotes before breed or before fawning season actually gives pronghorn a chance. Um, they get eaten very quick. Uh, a lot of other studies have shown um, bobcats to be a pretty good eater of them when they're young. Um, and then golden eagles actually eat quite a few as well. Uh, birds of prey do a number on them. And then once they're adults, um, again, the biggest killer of, of pronghorn would be coyotes. Um, and I get a lot of questions about how a, a coyote that can run 30 miles an hour can catch up to a pronghorn running 55 or more. Um, and the answer there is usually pronghorn or, or Coyotes are working in packs or, or, you know, there's a couple, two, three around that are, are watching. And, uh, you know, when you're, when you're changing off one, one chasing for another, uh, they, can, they can tire out a pronghorn after a while, or they can corral a pronghorn into another coyote that's laying in wait. Um, and that, that does, uh, it works pretty efficiently. And then if there's fences, uh, that just amplifies their ability to kill to kill pronghorn. Um, they can trap them up against it. Pronghorn have very set crossing areas. Um, even, even if the whole fence is up, they like crossing in the same area every time and it'll take two or three years for them to shift from a crossing. Um, and so if, if a coyote is running them down a fence line, um, they can pin them up against that fence very easily. Oh, interesting. So will they jump a fence or, or I know they would prefer to go under, but will they jump a fence? They, they will. Yeah. Uh, okay. I've seen it twice. Um, both times I, I had to stop the car and pull over and make sure I wasn't seeing things. Um, I saw one up by Taos and I saw another one in Texas and yeah, uh, they, they can jump and they, they aren't as graceful about it as a deer or an elk. Um, but they they have the potential to jump five or six feet in the air. Uh, but that that jumping is is a learned behavior, um, and it gets passed down from you know mom to fawn and and so on. And pronghorns seem content going underneath them uh, because they can you know turn their head and and slide almost underneath it at a a very fast rate. Um, and so if if it works for them, they just keep doing it. That's that's pretty cool. Um, so I have one correction. So at Albertsons, they have the rules and information booklet, maybe not eyeballs, that which makes oh, way well, more sense yeah. to me. <laughs> there, there goes my dinner plans. I guess. <laughs> so, so I know oh, throughout the 19th century, pronghorn made a pretty good comeback in New Mexico. But if we were to kind of break it out into quadrants of the states, what, what are the herds looking like right now? Yeah, so statewide, uh, we're sitting at a little over 60,000 individuals. Um, that includes males and females, and this year's young. Um, if we were to, you know, break the state into its four quadrants, you know, using 25 or, or uh, yeah, 25 north and south, and then 40 east and west, um, the majority, the large majority of the pronghorn are in the northeast quadrant. Um, you see them every time, like you said, driving from Las Vegas to Raton, there's hundreds of them if, if you keep your eyes open on either side of the road. Um, the, that, that area probably makes up uh, almost half of the pronghorn in the state, um, that, that, the, the plains up there. Um, it's usually the animals up there are a little smaller if you're looking for trophy animals, but they're, uh, they're much more populated up there and so you see them pretty much everywhere. Um, as you move into the southeast, 
the population starts fading a little bit um, when you're in like the uh, Carrizozo area and uh, Socorro, like those areas, um, there, there's a, a pretty good population pocket in there. And then as you move down the eastern, uh, the eastern third of the state, you know, closer to Roswell, um, uh, Fort Sumner, like all, all those areas, um, as you move south, it just starts dwindling. <laughs> Um, and a lot of that is just habitat uh, down in the southeast. There's a lot of, of brushy species that are taking over the, the rangelands. Um, I think those grasslands down there are a bit more sensitive to grazing. Um, and, and there's also a lot less rainfall down there um, as opposed to the northeast area. So those rangelands don't bounce back as quickly. Um, and I think some of the, some of the rangeland down there, you're still seeing effects from you know, the Dust Bowl and, and before of uh, overgrazing. And so that, that all, the, all the grazing, you know, coupled with, with just poor habitat in general, um, starts dropping numbers a bit. Uh, there, there are a lot of animals there still, but they just are, are more, less densely populated in those areas. Um, as you move into the southwest corner of the state, um, it gets a lot drier, uh, especially in the Boot Heel region. Um, the, there are still pretty good pockets of pronghorn down there, um, but I think your density drops off even more and you start running into uh, knowledge goes a long way in those areas, especially when it comes to hunting. Um, if you don't know the area, you're gonna have a really hard time finding the pronghorn down there. Um, and then you have, you know, the kind of the southern side of the, the Gila um, in like close to Silver City and, and that region. Um, there's a pretty good pocket of pronghorn. And then if you follow, uh, 25 does a bit of a bend there, but you know, in between 25 and the Gila, um, there's also some pretty good populations as well. Um, and you know, those are, we're talking maybe three, 4,000 individuals as an estimate um, in each of those groups. So it's, it's a lot less than uh, say the Northeast where we're talking 25 to 30,000 pronghorn. Um, it's, it's a lot less, but uh, they're out there for sure. It's a little harder hunting. You can't just look out with a pair of binoculars and, and see them. Um, you got to get up high and, and really do a lot of work to see those animals. And then as you move into the northwestern quarter of the state, um, those numbers have slid a lot, um, even in the, the recent years. Um, that is due a lot to habitat. Um, a lot of that area is being being overcome by brushy, woody species. Um, you're seeing a lot less uh, grazable areas for, for pronghorn to get uh, the forbs they need. Um, and then all of that cover also supplies cover for their predators like coyotes and bobcats. And um, it's, it's harder for them to have fawns in areas like that because they get eaten really quickly. So areas like, uh, I know we lumped together a lot of units up there, so two, seven, nine, and 10 are all in one hunt uh, because it's, they're very, very sparse um, and they, they get, uh, the population numbers are, are definitely lower there in that region of the state. That's interesting. So overall, our, our trends are looking pretty good right now. Um, yeah. yeah. And I've heard from a few people that um, if you're looking for quantity of pronghorn you look in the northeast but if you're looking for um, a trophy or a, a larger horned animal maybe that the southeast is is kind of a, a good starting place oh yeah yeah definitely uh there there have been several over 85 shot every year um in the southeast corner of the state it's i think it's a little more remote and it's a lot more walking um and so you know if if you aren't willing to put in the, the time and effort beforehand to scout for those individuals and then to put in the miles on the boots to look for them as well. Um, you won't see those monsters, but they're out there. Um, and so there's, there's a few guides um, and then just regular, you know, ranchers and hunters out there who uh, really put in the effort and, and find 90 inch pronghorn, you know, just outside of Roswell. And it's an area where, people see a lot of, of pronghorn. And if you're happy shooting, you know, a, maybe a 60 or 65 inch pronghorn, they're there for sure. And you'll, you'll get them. Um, but if you really want to spend a lot of time and dedication to the animals, you can find 85 plus inches walking around out there. 
the current Boone and Crocker, Crockett, Boone and Crockett record is from New Mexico, if I'm not mistaken, and somewhere in the southeast is my understanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I want to say it's right just over 96 inches, maybe. Um, it's huge. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it was taken taken in New Mexico. Um, I'm pretty sure the, the Pronghorn Guide Service guys uh, guided that one. Um, and it might have been one of the, the Gallo uh, brothers that that purchased that tag. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, they, they pull big ones out every year. And I know um, that that uh, Carrizozo area has some some big ones as well that ranchers have seen for years out there. That, that's cool. Uh, I, I just hope I get to see those someday. <laughs> They're <laughs> rare. I, I mean, you're talking, part. if you converted it to whitetails, you're talking like 210 inches. I mean, they're, they're huge. <laughs> so. Well, there's another bucket list picture for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. There you go. So how do we go about, I mean, there, there's one pronghorn biologist for the entire state of New Mexico. And, and I know you work with the conservation officers and other biologists, but how do you go about getting population estimates for all of these critters all over the state? Uh, I live in an airplane uh, for several months of the year. Uh, when um, one of the one of the best ways to survey pronghorn and and a lot of you know the western states all get together with WAFLA, um, the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, uh, they get together and we talk about methods for surveying. Um, a lot of the older methods were driving uh, in a car and just looking out the windows. Uh, we've tried helicopters, but really the only way to get enough distance um, to see these animals and, and to cover enough miles is, is with an airplane, a fixed wing aircraft. And so um, usually it starts in July and runs pretty close to the beginning of the hunting season. Um, I go up with our pilot and we have transects set out across usually about a third of the state. And we, I think this last year, we flew 4,200 miles um, in a month. And it's every day we're sitting in there. Uh, we have observers that are just sitting there looking for pronghorn um, on these transects. And when we see them, we can, uh, we can judge distances. And then we, we fly over to the group and we circle them. Um, and they kind of bunch up in a nice little little ball and then we line them out and do a nice straight line and we fly next to them and because they can run so fast usually the plane you know it, it's faster than them but it doesn't seem that much faster at 200 feet so you're able to count uh how many young uh you know juveniles are in there how many are does and then how many are bucks mm -hmm. and that allows us to estimate buck to doe ratios um and, and lets us know if you know we're, we're removing too many bucks from the landscape it allows us to count fawn doe ratios to know if there's issues with predation or or food and nutrient needs or water needs. Um, if, if we're not seeing a whole lot of juveniles, you know that that lets us know that there's something wrong. And so we we're able to fly all of that, and then every three years we come back to the same areas, um, and it, it allows us to get a good gauge of how those populations are doing across the state. That's really cool. We're getting several people on Facebook that say they want your job. So, you know, <laughs> the next generation. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you pretty much love your job, though. So <laughs> I love it. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> okay. And then so we're able to, to take the estimates that you get. And I know we use the harvest report data um, that, that we've mm -hmm. requested of everybody who hunts in New Mexico. And that's essentially how we um, determine herd uh, uh, license allocations for each GMU. Is, is yep. that end about right? Yeah. So you know those those numbers allow us to you know like the the ratios allow us to assess health a lot of the population and then um, just seeing animals and knowing how far we flew on surveys allows us to get a, a density estimate and um, we know. How much habitat there is for pronghorn in the state and so we can get a good a good guess of how many individuals are out there and that allows us to um you know once we look at the the private public split in units uh we can say how many uh pronghorn would be on that public land and then we uh we are allowed to set you know sustainable harvest limits for those public lands so we aren't over harvesting animals and then that allows us to you know kind of put a number on it and that uh, we, we double check that with with harvest data that comes from our hunters and so we can see whether or not you know if 
I think the average for New Mexico for harvest success is just over 75% or somewhere around 75%, which is pretty darn good uh, compared, you know, I bet, I bet elk hunters and deer hunters wish they had those, those success numbers. Um, but that, that allows us to gauge, you know, whether or not there are too many, um, too many animals being taken or, or we're giving out more permits in an area than, than there are actually animals. And then we can turn our sites, you know, and focus them and, and know whether or not we can increase or decrease those, those allocations. Interesting. It, it, it's always really cool to kind of listen to, to how we do it and how we set it. Um, and I know you weren't here, but in, in 2018, the department made some, some pretty big changes to the, the pronghorn hunting, uh, yeah. to, to the whole program. So um, we can't blame you since you weren't here <laughs> or, or, or celebrate with you because um, yeah. I, I know people that love it and people that hate it. But can you kind mm -hmm. of talk about those changes a little bit and, and how that's affected the hunting? Yeah, absolutely. So in 2018, uh, we got rid of A plus, uh, and it's it's gone. Um, what, what was, and that what was A plus? Is, the A plus was the antelope uh, public land use system, uh, and so it, you know it takes after E plus, obviously, and then we changed the E to A because we called them antelope. Um, P plus was too redundant, I guess, but. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we, we got rid of that old system, which had public landowners uh, enrolling in a system and distributing tags um, to them based on acreage and habitat. Uh, that system worked for, for the, its, its purpose and its duration, um, but there were a lot of ranches in, in the, the later years that were, you know, in some units you had to have over 5,000 acres to even be considered, um, which is a large chunk of land. Um, and uh, and hunters were assigned to ranches uh, to hunt and stuff like that. Um, and there were some some displeased hunters through that process. And so uh, the game commission voted to get rid of it, and we came up with a new one. Um, if any if any of the listeners are familiar with the deer program, it runs the same exact way. Um, now, private land tags are unlimited and over the counter. Um, if there is a hunt for your unit, um, and there's even some, some units that are too, too much private land and not enough public to have a public hunt. And so we have, uh, there's even additional couple units that are just private land that also have hunts. Um, and so if you, if you own a ranch or you know someone that owns a ranch, you can go in and you can purchase an over-the-counter private land pronghorn tag. Um, and you need to have uh, written permission that you carry with you for the whole duration of your hunt and that would be uh, restricted to a GMU and so you can you could have access to five or six different ranches in that GMU but you are limited to say like 41 or something um, and you could only hunt on ranches inside of 41 but it's it's unlimited uh, to the landowner to have as many hunters as they would like on their property and so that's I guess that's the biggest change. And now, now public draw, uh, which has, has changed obviously too, you're no longer assigned to a ranch. Um, ranches are only allowed to hunt their private deeded acres. Those ranchers aren't allowed to hunt state land office, uh, forest service or BLM lands. And then the public hunters are, um, you can take that public draw license. You can hunt private property with it if you have written permission, but you are also uh, allowed to hunt all of the state land office, forest service, or BLM lands inside of that unit. So I'm going to guess that that's what most people will be doing is, is going through the draw process and, um, and hoping. I, I know there's not a lot of tags out there, but there's a, there's a pretty good number. And um, if I were... Yeah, if I recall There's just that, over 2,400 okay. tags for New Mexico through the draw, the draw process. Okay, so, so not a lot, but, mm -hmm. <laughs> but you know, I think it's a, it's a good opportunity in, if you're looking for um, a number of animals, there's some good places to put in for. Um, I, I know there's a few people asking about draws, and um, we did a whole episode on reading the draw odds report, so I will refer people back to that one. Um, yep. but, you know, when people call you and, and they ask like, what, what area do you recommend? Um, what, what's your, what's your best answer or your most common answer? So my first question to them is whether they are a trophy hunter and you're looking for a big, a big buck, or if this is your, you know, if you just want to go out and shoot a pronghorn. Um, 
and usually that brings me down two different trails. Uh, if, if individuals are just interested in seeing lots of pronghorn on a hunt and getting lots of opportunities at, you know, spot and stocks and, and just glassing up a lot of individuals, uh, the Northeast is the way to go. <laughs> you can't beat it. Uh, 58, 59, um, you know, 41, like those, those areas in the state uh, are where you will see a lot of pronghorn. 47 is also another one. Um, and yeah, the, those ones are where you'll see large numbers you will have to work pretty hard to see uh, a non Boone and Crockett buck. Uh, you know, I, I don't think people are going to be shooting 82 inches. They, they happen, um, but it's a lot less likely that you're going to shoot anything over 80 inches out there. Uh, but you'll see a lot between maybe 50 and, and 70. Um, those, those are everywhere out there. Um, and you'll get a lot of potential to see those individuals. Now, as you move, if they tell me that they're interested in trophy hunting um, or, or just seeing, you know, the biggest animals they can see, it's usually the Southeast that I direct them towards. Um, they're, they're out there and I always tell them it's going to be a lot of work. Uh, you aren't just going to step out of your door and shoot, you know, an 80 inch or otherwise that wouldn't be where the, the Boone and Crockett score is right. You know, that's it's for the, the upper, <laughs> the upper animals. Um, and so uh, yeah, 30, 31 has uh, some good, good animals, 32. And then, you know, in that 18, uh, like unit 18 has, has quite a few good pockets as well. Um, another one that is, is maybe more of a historical trophy unit uh, is in um, like 16E, which we lump all of them together for problem. It's all 16. But uh, the, the Plains of St. Augustine, um, have have their reputation and they've upheld it for many years um it's it's super hard to draw them they're one of the most put in for units in the state uh so it's it's difficult if you're applying for it you're gonna sit there for years waiting to draw a tag um it's it's hard but you know it's, it's got a reputation because there were a lot of big bucks pulled out of there uh in the 90s and early 2000s so you see it you see a lot of that um and and you know if you're if you're solely going for trophy units in the state there's a lot of people that know those trophy units and they're all putting in for them and so you can wait you know 25 years hoping to draw a trophy pronghorn hunt or a trophy pronghorn unit um and it's it's a lot uh <laughs> there's there's several units you know uh 18 33 17 16 38 all of those um, are kind of in that region and they have big bucks, but I even put down on my, my little piece of paper, I went through the draw odds and looked at those. And those are areas where there's over, over 2000 applications putting in for 25 tags or, or less. Um, and so it's, it's, it's hard to draw for them. <laughs> it's hard to draw, but if you don't apply, then you have no chance yeah. of getting drawn. Yeah, so I can guarantee you, you will not draw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guarantee you, you won't draw for one of those units if you don't put in. You will not get a tag in the mail saying congratulations. So, yeah. <laughs> That's, you know, I, I, I say that a lot when I'm talking to, to customers and to constituents on the phone is that, you know, if, if you don't put in, you, you don't know. It, somebody has to get that tag. So there, yep. there's a chance yep. that you could be that person. There's an equal chance that exactly. anybody could be that person. So, yeah. Um, cool. So, if you put in for the draw and, and you get drawn, um, how do you go about um, figuring out what section of land you want to hunt on? Um, and how do you get access to different lands like, like state lands or BLM? Um, how, how would you go about doing that? Yeah, so I, I get that question a lot. Um, I think pronghorn hunters in particular struggle finding uh, public land. And um, I think a bit of it is just that the animals are so visible that you, you think it might be an easier hunt to go out and find them. Um, but the reality is that you have to find them on the right square <laughs> at the right time, you know? And so um, I use Onyx personally. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I can plug that, but uh, I use it religiously. Um, you know, we do share data with them. And so they can see where, you know, you have a pretty accurate estimate of where BLM state and forest service stuff is. Uh, I know we also had an app that works with the state land office for 
um, identifying where state land office land is. And so um, e even if you go onto the state land office website, they have a little maps tab. And one of the choices on the maps tab is hunting, hunting lands. Uh, it's, it's catered solely to hunters. Um, and so, you know, if you're in the Northeast, you're gonna see a lot of forest service and a lot of, uh, of state land office. And as you start moving South, you get into more BLM areas. Um, I, I've, I haven't found good ways to find BLM maps. I struggle with that. And so that's, that's usually where Onyx kicks in uh, with, with finding BLM lands. Um, but I know the forest service puts their blocks out there. So if you're hunting in the, the grasslands up in the Northeast, um, those areas are really, really good. Um, and so, yeah, the first thing I always do when I'm getting ready to hunt pronghorn is I look at my unit, uh, New Mexico Game and Fish even has GMU maps. I know you showed that with Travis's presentation. We, we put maps out there that show all of this public land, um, in your unit. And that's where I start. Um, I also try to familiarize myself with roads. Um, you know, a lot of we do take into account when we're allocating tags to public land, landlocked public land uh, that is unaccessible. And so we don't incorporate that into our population numbers and, and it's out there. And so, you know, if you can't cross private land to get to public land just because it's public. Uh, so uh, one of the things I also do is I go to uh, whatever county I'm hunting in, um, I will go to their website and look for roadmaps. Uh, a lot of most counties publish their public roadmaps, and that's a great tool to know you're driving down a road that isn't closed um, or a private ranch road or something, because that can run you into a lot of trouble. And I get a lot of calls from people saying, hey, I was driving down this road, it looked good. You know, it, it might even have a road sign or a stop sign on it, um, but it might be a private road. And so I always urge people, um, I know several game wardens that carry those, those public roadmaps with them. Um, make sure you know what is a public road and what's not, and then use that roadmap to identify public land that you can access from those roads. Um, and it might be a bit of a hike in, you might, you know, have to walk a mile or two to get to a larger chunk, but at least then you know you're legal. Um, if you've purchased your stamps, uh, you can hunt uh, all the federal land, all the Forest Service, all the BLM, and you can hunt those state land office lands. Uh, they are 100% open to you. You know, the department pays for, for hunters to utilize those lands, um, and, and we hope that they do. So it's, it's kind of, it, it requires a lot of research. Um, you shouldn't just drive down a road and hope that, you know, you can get to whatever public land is out there. Uh, like I said, use those county road maps, uh, look, up, look, look them up and find them, and that, that can help uh, narrow down areas that are, are huntable. And I usually start with that. I just go, all right, where's the areas that are huntable? And then, you know, uh, a month before I'll, I'll drive out there and drive down those roads and, you know, mark down on a GPS or something where I see animals, uh, even if it's not on public land, but I can get a good idea of, you know, if there's a large group around here or I don't see many on the other half of the unit. Um, and and that's that's a really good place to start. Uh, if you don't put in that work beforehand, you can come out opening day and find a gate across the road that you thought was public because it shows up on Onyx or on, you know, your GPS software um, and it might not be a public road. So I think that's, that's one of the biggest things is knowing what is public and what's not. And, um, you know, people are, I, I know our game wardens respond to a lot of those calls and are always happy to, to assist people in knowing, knowing where you're stepping. <laughs> so. And I'll, I'll also mention that uh, we have a partnership with BLM on an app that's a free app that people can download called Carry Maps, and that's a great addition. I, I know a lot of hunters who use Carry Map and on X to kind of kind of hit both and in for extra verification. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, it, and on X, if you if you haven't used it, um, they are partnering with the department uh, on an incentive program. So. If you apply for the draw before March 10th, everyone will get, uh, everyone who doesn't currently have it will get a 20% discount to Onyx. So it's, it's a great opportunity if you if you don't already have it to go ahead and, and get that. So mm -hmm. I know that that's on, on a list for, <laughs> for a few people, but um, yeah. what, what a great way to get a good tool and, and for a discounted price. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and uh, it's helped immensely. I, I mean, just being able to, to, you know, drive, see your dot and drive past a little blue chunk and go, oh, <laughs> that's public because, you know, a lot of these, uh, these lease lands for, for state land, especially, mm -hmm. um, they don't have to put fences up, you know, it, it's not a subdivided fence around that, that section. And so it looks a lot just like the rest of the ranch. Um, or, or, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't tell it apart if you were just driving down the road uh, without some kind of thing telling you that that is public. Sorry, making a note. Um, so bouncing back just a little bit, um, if you get a, a, a hunt that is listed under a ranch-wide ranch -wide agreement, do you have to have written permission for that? Yeah, yep. So there... The ranch wide program um, is a is a program that allows a ranch to enroll its private acres and its public acres into a huntable unit um, that uh, they, they get tags through that. So every once in a while, those landowners will, you know, uh, will sell uh, access to their property and give out those tags um, to in individuals that want to hunt it. Um, those tags then are good for all the private land and the public lease land for that landowner. Mm -hmm. And in turn, uh, the public land hunters that draw for that unit are able to go and hunt those private deeded acres on that ranch. And so if you're a public hunter who has a permit and you're hunting the private acreage, you do not need uh, written permission from that landowner. It is open. They've signed an agreement with us. Uh, we put those maps on the website. Uh, usually around July, uh, and I, I can give Tristana a link to that. It's on the Pro Pronghorn private land page. Um, and so we, we keep those out there. You don't need permission to hunt those private deeded acres. Uh, but if you are an individual who purchases one of the, the uh, access to that land and you get a tag from that landowner, you do need written permission to be on that, that public land because uh, <laughs> Uh, if a game warden stops you and you have a private land tag and you're hunting on public land, you're going to be in trouble. So. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah. One more thing no I want to talk about, and then um, I know we have a bunch of um, questions that we've either, either topics that we've already covered and um, kind of elaborate on those a little bit more or are something we haven't touched on yet. But I wanted to talk a little bit about diseases. Um, and I know pronghorn are pretty different. Um, we were talking earlier about it and I, I Wanted to bring it up to everybody. Um, we get a lot of questions for deer and elk about CWD, but that doesn't seem to really be an issue with pronghorn. Yeah, so biologically, uh, while, while pronghorn are related to, to elk and deer, um, they're not part of the, the cervid family, and they're their own unique family uh, that, that, you know, they share a common ancestor way, way back down the line, but they've, they've developed their own their own uh, immune systems and, and things that they can cope with. And so um, when they come to, to uh, sorry, <laughs> a comment popped up and I was reading it. Um, anyways, uh, <laughs> uh, when it comes to diseases, um, there are a few. So CWD is not an issue with pronghorn uh, that we have discovered yet. Uh, I'll phrase that that way. Um, there have been several studies um, none of them have shown CWD coming into pronghorn. Now, uh, another one that impacts a lot of, of ungulate species is blue tongue or, um, or EHD, both of those. Uh, they're very similar. Um, I, I looked them up because of our conversation earlier, and I, they are different, but they're, they're very, very close. Um, and there have been several outbreaks of that. I know in, uh, you, usually you have to get, you know, drought periods, so they're, they're drinking from water that might be contaminated, or, um, or you get congregations of, of individuals. Um, you see it in Wyoming because they have large populations, uh, much larger than, than any other states. Um, but I know like back in the 70s, there was a, a, an outbreak of blue tongue up there that killed over 3,000 pronghorn. Um, it happens, uh, usually they're pretty localized and usually it, it, it's not that big of a deal. Um, New Mexico, because we have a lot fewer pronghorn than them and, and you know, more, more habitat across the state, uh, they're spread out a lot more and we don't see large outbreaks like that. Um, there's also some, some worms and, uh, <laughs> and other parasites that get into their bodies, um, no different than deer and elk. Uh, 
They don't kill a lot of them. Uh, most of them just die because they are hunted or eaten. Um, and then we discover that they had worms. Um, and my recommendation for that is just cook your meat. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of eating, you know, medium rare, or maybe even on the rare side of, of problem. Um, but make sure that, uh, that you're cooking it to the, the, at least the minimum temperature and it'll take care of all of those, those worms and, and, uh, parasites in their bodies. So. That's cool. I'm, I'm sure there's guidance out there from, um, a, a cooking related place for temperatures that you should, you should cook it to, but. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's I think it's fascinating that they're they're um, affected differently by by some of those or, or don't even have the opportunity to get some of those diseases. So um, yeah, most of most of what comes into them actually comes from like sheep and goats uh, more so than like domestic domestic sheep and goats, and a lot less than uh, from cattle, uh, which is where you're getting a lot of your your you know uh, deer and elk diseases. Awesome. Okay. So we're going to back up um, just a little bit <laughs> and kind of bounce around with some questions here. Um, but we have a lot of really yeah. great questions that I, that I want to touch on. So um, are, are most of the tags that we offer buck tags or do we have doe or either sex tags? We do. Uh, the, the female immature hunts um, and, and the immature is just a, a buck with, with horns shorter than its ears. Um, those I believe in the state are all for uh, uh, youth hunters, except maybe around the Roswell area. Um, I think there might be a, a female immature hunt there that's not youth only. Um, and then those, yeah, those hunts uh, are, are the only female immature hunts we have. We do have some, uh, you know, some landowners that enroll in programs to, to decrease populations. Um, and that's, that's a thing where we'll remove some female immature. So if people are really looking through the harvest reports, they might see some female immatures that are harvested that aren't part of hunts. Um, and those are, those are in that program. Um, but for the most part, all of our female immature hunts are for, uh, for youth. And um, then there's that one around Roswell. Uh, but I don't, I'm not sure that we have either sex hunts. I think all the rest are mature bucks. Okay. And I'm, I'm guessing that that is, that, that a buck can cover um, multiple does, and so the, there's a better chance for fawn recruitment. Oh, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, one, one buck will breed anywhere over, over 10, 10 does for sure in a breeding season, and they're also one of the only documented cases where, uh, where pronghorn, pronghorn almost always have twins. Uh, when the, when the does give birth to fawns, there's always, always two of them, sometimes three. Um, but with those twins, uh, they're one of the only ungulate species that has ever had, uh, pair paternality, uh, where, where two males can give birth to two different youth inside of one female. Um, and so, yeah, they, <laughs> the males get around a lot during the rut. And uh, even if there's one buck that has his harem of does, there's always satellite bucks, just like with elk uh, that run around the outside. And their sole purpose is just to breed as many does as they can. Interesting. <laughs> so when does the rut uh, usually take place in New Mexico? Um, right around September, uh, about the second week in September. Um, you can see them going. Um, it, it, it fluctuates a bit, uh, especially I know in the in the south uh, the southwest corner of the state because it's so hot and it's it's really a it's its own kind of pronghorn population down there. Um, you'll see uh, fawns being born later in the year, which would imply that the the females are getting bred later in the year. Um, and so I wouldn't doubt it if the rut is still going on down there maybe even in the first week of October or so. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of a gradient. It'll start in the northeast corner of the state and start working its way down to the, the southwest corner. And so you can see it as early as the first week in September and as late as probably the first week in October. Oh, wow. So after most of the hunting seasons get over. Yeah, and in August, there are, there are bucks that'll start showing some rutting behavior. Uh, you know, they'll challenge each other they'll be ripping up the grass and throwing sagebrush I saw one on my hunt this year that destroyed a sunflower 
um, <laughs> leaving, leaving it sent all over it and stuff. Um, and, and that was in August. So they're, they're definitely thinking about it in August and there's a lot of pre-rut behavior, uh, but most of the actual main rut is happening in September and then a lot of the breeding is happening in September. Okay, in interesting. <laughs> I, I remember being on a sage grouse hunt one time and watching, watching the rut take place and it's absolutely fascinating. So if you haven't seen it, it's, it would be great to even just go out and, and photograph or get some video with your cell phone. It's pretty cool to watch. Absolutely. Yeah. They'll, they'll run side by side. You know, uh, it's one of the, the weirdest rituals that I've seen males do, but they'll actually have speed challenges. And so a male will race and another one will race alongside of it and whichever one can cut off the other one first is kind of the, the winner. Um, and they, they get bragging rights. And then they also use their, their horns to spar just like uh, a deer or an elk would. Um, and they, they get pretty, pretty brutal. You'll see them with cuts, up and down their necks and, and bleeding and stuff. So yeah, <laughs> it gets, get into it. it it's fascinating. <laughs> so how far will a pronghorn travel in their lifetime? And, and that answer may be a little bit different for different states and migration routes. Is that right? Oh yeah, a hundred, hundred percent. Uh, you know, there's, there's herds in Wyoming, uh, that, that obviously that red desert, um, that it, it that red desert migration route is has gotten a lot of publicity lately um and the wyoming migration initiative uh has done a lot of research on them uh a lot with mule deer and and stuff like that but also they have a lot of pronghorn collared um and so up in, up north there's a lot bigger bigger movements from those individuals every year um i think some of their migratory routes are 50 60 miles long one way um and that's, that's twice a year that they're moving that distance. Uh, a lot of the ones in New Mexico, other than that, that northern herd in the, um, you know, up in, in 50, 52 in that area, um, other than those ones, I'd say most of your individuals probably live within a, uh, you know, maybe five, six square miles, um, and they, they won't have to leave that area. Um, and so they'll, they'll sit there and if there's water and there's food, uh, they're pretty content remaining where they are. Um, if you had a calculator, uh, you know, a conservative estimate of maybe the upper end of what they move is maybe six miles a day. And in, in the wild, pronghorn live for uh, their average life expectancy is about six years. And so whatever six miles times 365 for six years is, that probably be the the maximum of what those animals would move. A lot. Interesting. Yeah, it's really? a lot. <laughs> <laughs> when you're out hunting, um, um, what signs should you look for in the field besides the the, the big white butt? <laughs> um, that's usually what I look for. Uh, you can see uh, pronghorn will leave will leave scrapes uh, just like a like a deer would. Um, usually, it's by like a, a taller piece of vegetation, so maybe some choya um, that, you know, like there's nothing around it and there'll just be a piece of uh, a choya cactus and at the base of it, you'll see like a, a dirt patch um, that they might rub up against or, or you know, kick up and urinate in. Um, if you see uh, like s sunflowers, if you're in, you know, that an area that has sunflowers or taller vegetation and it's just beat, beat up, uh, a lot of the yucca, um, when, when they put up their fruits, if their fruits are still standing, you'll see that's broken up or torn up. Um, pronghorn have a pretty strong fragrance about them. Uh, and I know that's a reason that a lot of people don't like eating their meat. Uh, if, if, you know, they say it tastes like they smell, um, kind of smells like Fritos or something. I, it's hard to describe. It's super salty smelling. Um, but that's, uh, that, that's a pretty good implication that a pronghorn was there and, and left its mark. Um, and so I, I'd say looking for that, uh, one of the big ones that I see again in hunting a lot is just looking for tracks. Uh, they'll, they'll a lot of times follow a trail because uh, it's easier than walking somewhere else. Um, and so you'll see tracks, uh, fence crossings are a huge deal. Like I said, they cross the same place every time for the most part. And so you'll be able to see, uh, you know, big worn out kind of washes underneath a, a fence wire. Um, and those are something I look for uh, in addition to just 
the, the best way to see pronghorn is the glass. And it's, it's tough because when you're out there, you know, maybe a 20 foot hill is the highest elevation you can get. But uh, that, that little elevation is, is the best thing you can do. And you're just sitting there and, and glassing. That, that's awesome. Um, so yeah. the comment about Fritos and that they smell like Fritos, um, people are saying they love Fritos. <laughs> Well, then start eating pronghorn. I don't. I don't know. I think I, uh, pronghorn gets a big, uh, a bad rap along uh, amongst the ungulate hunters. Just as a aside, um, I hear it a lot as a pronghorn biologist. People are always like, "Oh, this tastes disgusting." Um, in my experience, the best thing you can do, and you should do it with all your animals, but pronghorn in particular, because you're hunting in August and it could be a hundred degrees, especially in New Mexico. Uh, the quicker you can get to them. Uh, as soon as they're dead, they're, they're pretty small. They bleed out pretty quickly. Um, get there as fast as you can and skin it, cape it. Even if you aren't going to keep the cape, get the skin off of it and quarter it as soon as possible. Take that meat off, get it cooled, get it exposed to air. Um, their internal temperature is right around like 105 degrees, just normally. And their hair is designed to keep that heat in. Like I said, they're, they're really good thermal regulators. They'll go from Alberta to Mexico, so they can keep heat in if they need to. And uh, when they're dead, that heat just gets stored in there and it does bad things to the meat. So as soon as you shoot one, get the cape off, get the meat off and get it exposed to air. And as fast as you can get it processed and put into a freezer, do it. And it, it, yeah, it's some of the most tender meat I've ever had in my life. And if it's taken care of, it tastes better than, than any of the other species out there. Yeah, it, it's definitely really good. But I, I agree, the quicker you can get it cool down and, and keep it clean and don't let that dirt get in yeah. there. It, it, yeah, yeah, don't kick dirt in it. If you, if you get blood all over your gloves, like maybe you have to change gloves or wash your hands, something. Um, watch out for the scent glands in the neck and, and in the rump. Um, if you run your knife through them, change the blade, wash your knife off something. Um, it will, it, it's not as bad as a, maybe a javelina or something like that going through the scent glands, but it contaminates the meat really quickly. Okay, so circling back around, um, at the beginning, we were talking about um, the transplant program. And it, 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 can you talk a little bit about why we do that? Is it for genetic diversity and other locations? Um, and then my other question with transplants, or translocations, I'm sorry, is um, have we given any to the Santa Ana Pueblo for their reinduction program that you know of? Um, I don't know if we have or not. Uh, I, if I'm completely honest, I have no idea. Um, that would be something we can look up and, and let that individual know. Or if they want to send me an email, go ahead, I'll get, I'll get back to them. Um, I, can, I can ask about that because... We haven't since I've been here, but that's only been a year and a half. So um, <laughs> that hasn't happened as uh, in, in my knowledge, but it, it very well could have before I got here. Um, and then for transplants, so genetic diversity um, in ungulates, you don't actually need too many uh, individuals coming in with, with genetics. Uh, if you have a, a new individual that's not related to the, the ones in the herd come in every... Uh, I think it's every three or four generations, you've got more than enough genetic diversity being introduced. Um, and with how pronghorn, you know, move several miles to go chase groups of does, uh, you're definitely getting more than enough introduced into different herds. Uh, the reason we transplant pronghorn in New Mexico is to kind of bolster populations. Um, I know in the Southeast uh, in particular, we, we have good habitat down there. And um, on some BLM lands and, and state lands down there, we had fences that were, you know, as old as the 1800s laying out there. And uh, they were contributing to some really, really bad um, population dynamics where we had low fawn, fawn recruitment, uh, poor, just poor numbers in general. And so the department partnered with a couple other agencies and we went out there and pulled all those fences and really, you know, uh, got the ha habitat back up to where it should be and where it can be. Um, remove some of those, those woody species and, you know, stop grazing on those lands or, or practice some rotational grazing on those lands, stuff like that. And um, it's hard to bring a herd back from 
you know, the, the brink of not having any. And so there, there are some areas in the Northeast where landowners complain that they have too many. And instead of shooting them, um, we, we trap them and move them to other areas of the state. And I know um, like the, the areas in the Southeast where we have transplanted them, those animals have done extremely well. Um, and and I get, I'm still getting callers from, I got one last year uh, we, we collared a lot of the individuals to see, you know, how long they're sur surviving, if, if the changes we made are actually doing good for the herds. And uh, I got one last year that was eight years old on a, a collared male. And so they're living well past their life expectancy. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really good. Uh, and that, that's mainly why we do transplants. We also do some with, uh, with like Texas and Mexico. And we traded some pronghorn for Gould's turkeys uh, back in the day. Um, we've done a lot of stuff like that. So it's partnership with a lot of other agencies and then re, you know, reintroducing animals in our state so we can keep growing the herd. Cool. I, I think it's pretty fascinating. And, um, you know, when you, when you look at it, it really benefits the population and the species overall and mm -hmm. instead of just keeping that to ourselves where we're doing, doing good things for the overall health of the species. Yeah. Um, so jumping back a little bit to draw odds, I, I know you've done quite a bit of research on draw odds and that you've looked at it, but when somebody calls, um, you know, I have two different scenarios, but if somebody calls and they're trying to decide if they have better draw odds as a non-resident for deer, for mule deer, or for pronghorn, um, how do you help walk them through that process? And then for a non-resident, how would you, what would you kind of advise them on for looking at draw odds with, with pronghorn? Yeah, so... Um, I think as for, for sure, it, it depends on the unit. Um, let's, let's make that clear. Uh, the state's huge. And so some units might be higher for pronghorn, others might be higher for mule deer, but as, as a generality, um, as a non-resident, you have much better odds of drawing a mule deer. Uh, the, like if you're, we'll just take unit 31, for example, I know there's over 300 tags there. I want to say, um, and just purely by numbers being input, uh, you're much more likely to draw a hunt there as, as a non-resident for mule deer. Whereas, you know, for, for pronghorn, there's probably four or five permits for non-residents, maybe even less for that area. I know statewide, I just looked at the 2020 uh, draw odds, statewide we had 96 non-resident tags for the whole state. Um, it's tight and as a non-resident it's going to be really difficult and I'll, I'll be very frank about that uh 96 out of the 2400 tags went to non-residents um and so if you're looking at units like that uh try try hunting with archery tackle uh those hunts usually have fewer people putting in um if there's a hunt with less than 15 permits don't apply because you'll never get drawn um, with how the percentages work, it's got to be at least 15 permits or higher. Um, and most of these units where, uh, you know, we, we publish those draw odds, look at them, look at how many non-residents put in. Um, if, if there's three or four non-residents getting drawn, uh, that's going to be one of your best bets for a unit. Um, look for one of those that has, uh, you know, maybe a decent percent of success uh, with our success rate numbers and just try and balance those two as best as you can. Um, if you can't do that, uh, you can always try and apply through a guide and an outfitter because um, there's a few more tags for that. And then if that doesn't work as well, um, or if you don't want to go that route, that's okay. Uh, we do, like we, we talked about the private land program earlier, um, and that's, that's a great way to go. Uh, those tags, you know, we, we don't have a list of those landowners, so it's a lot of good old detective work on the non-residents to try and find those those ranches that are offering permits um but you know it might be as simple as as driving up to someone's house and knocking on a door um you know sometimes you can't beat good old-fashioned door knocking and, and <laughs> boot walking to to try and get uh tags to hunt private land um there's always that potential and i know you know a lot of the tags in the state that are used every year go towards those those uh, private lands. And so that that's always an opportunity for non-residents. If you can't get it in the draw, um, you know, you, you get the draw odds or you, you get the draw reports well before pronghorn season starts. So put in for the draw. If you don't draw, 
uh, there's always that alternative of going to a private landowner and, and acquiring a, a, a permit from them. And I'll mention again, we did a, a long episode um, in January with Kevin Rodden, and we talked about where to find the draw odds and how to read them and, and how to use them to your advantage. So I, I would recommend if you're interested in learning more, it's it's on the website, um, and that's a great resource to, to learn how to utilize those tools pretty easily. Um, it just takes some legwork out there. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, my last question for you, unless something else pops up that we haven't touched on, um, I, I know pronghorn are typically out in the open and in the grasslands, but do they ever go into the timber? Yeah, uh, they do. Um, I know particularly that migratory herd up north is moving through a lot of timber. Um, I mean, they're in, they're in elk country. Um, and, and they, well, even though they're up there, they they usually stick to like the, the riverine drainages where it's an open meadow and you've got, you know, a lot of water flowing through it. And that's where they're, they're living, but, or spending most of their time. But, you know, if you're going all the way from Chama to Taos, like you can't always just follow these nice little riverine areas and and i've gotten several reports from elk hunters that are you know in a in an aspen stand somewhere and they're like yeah i was hunting elk and i heard something moving and i snuck around and came up on a herd of pronghorn in the middle of you know a pine forest uh it happens quite a bit up there um they do they do move through some some areas with trees uh but it's they, they, they won't live in, in those areas. They're spending their time on the fringes and they might, they might go to those areas for, for maybe there's some good food, you know, underneath the tree um, or there's, uh, there's some shade if it's really hot out. I know um, there, there, there's sometimes a common misconception that pronghorn only like big flat grasslands and that's all they'll tolerate. Um, but in New Mexico and Arizona in particular, uh, a lot of these mesquite, you know, brush lens, uh, pronghorn are moving through those just as much as out on the prairie. It's just harder to see them because, you know, there's so, so many woody species for them to move around. And so I think the optimal level that they kind of strive for is like 15% of the land um, can be in these shrubby species, you know, whether it's sagebrush up north in the northeast or whether it's mesquite or um, some other species down south. But they do, they'll, they'll use that for winter feed. They'll, um, they'll use it for shade. Uh, they also use it for fawning. Uh, females in particular in the spring will go to some areas where it's maybe a little more rugged um, and they have some cover because they like tucking their fawns up underneath that cover. And so it's a necessity for their life. Um, I, I, I doubt you'd you know, be walking around in, in most wooded areas and expect to see a pronghorn. If you do, it's, it's rare and you should drink it in because it doesn't happen often, but it's not it's not uncommon enough that, uh, you know, it's a scientific anomaly. Uh, they'll, they'll move through it and, and they utilize it if they can, you know, see and, and stuff like that. Awesome. I, so thank you. I, I have learned a lot about pronghorn tonight and I'm sure that everyone else has. Um, so I, I want to thank you for your time. Um, I, I know you have a lot going on. <laughs> and so I, I appreciate you, um, you being here and a thank you to everybody who has joined us here on Zoom tonight and um, for everybody that's on Facebook as well. Um, I, I have one quick reminder to everybody that the draft deadline is March 17th. It's one month from today. So March 17th at 5 p.m. So you want to have your application completed before 5 p.m. because the, it will shut off and kick you out of the system if you have not completed it. Um, and the deadline to qualify for incentives is on um, March 10th. <laughs> so make sure and meet that because, I mean, you apply a little bit early and you get to, the opportunity to get some really, really cool prizes, um, or not prizes, but um, items that our partners have, have donated. I mean, you can check those out on our website. Um, we have them all listed there. But thank you, Tony. We really, really appreciate your time. Yeah, no worries. And, and I just, a quick plug, I, I, I uh, I, I want to thank all the hunters and, and people uh, that own land in the state and encourage hunting. Um, you know, it, it, like, like I think pronghorn are a great story. And, and we started off with, you know, saying in, in the 1850s, before the 1850s, it was abundant and unregulated hunting and, and poor land management really can decimate populations. And so if it wasn't for hunters and, and fishers 
out there, you know, putting money into the system and taxing themselves and, and landowners willing to let people hunt on their land and to, to be, you know, do practices that benefit wildlife, you know, we, we wouldn't have it and we won't for future generations if we don't continue to do that. And so I, I can't thank people enough that, that do that kind of those activities and, and that kind of work on their properties. That, that's a great point, absolutely. Um, and, and I'll throw it out there. Um, if, if you are interested in talking about pronghorn, call Tony, because you may think you may have a 10 minute conversation coming, but you will be on the phone for a, an hour. He told me this himself, so. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah I'm always, always, always down to talk pronghorn and you know, email, email or cell phone. Uh, you know, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. I, I, I want to make New Mexico a great pronghorn state, um, and it is, and we should continue to be that, so. Cool. Well, thank you for that and for your passion. And um, for anybody who wants to join us next week, I believe we'll be talking with Austin Teague and Nicole Tatman about Barbary sheep and Ibex, um, but Oryx, all of those, all the exotic species. So, so join us next week to talk about, about some different species in New Mexico. But thank you guys and have a great evening. Thank <laughs> you.